This is a Marshall Enterprises presentation. Peace, peace everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another presentation. And today we need to tackle or get into the subject of do not detain, the do not detain list. Um, do not stop and question. The junk is called an injunction. It's also a order of protection, sort of. So let's 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 break it down. You may have seen other videos or people, and I forgive this, a black man, green screen behind me, and you know what? I don't need these for this. You may have watched videos and presentations of people talking about you need to get on the do not detain list, you need to do this, you need to do that. And very little explanation was given as to what it is and how you actually get on this list. Is it a list? What is that about? In this video, I break down how you are to answer tickets, how to get out of summonses, citations, etc. And the reasons given in that presentation have to do with the problems, the defects, let's use the legal words that they would use, the defects with regards to the stop itself. The officer is an adversary. The officer saw you or is alleging that you did an infraction. The officer pulls you over. The officer gets your information, gives you a summons or a citation or a ticket, and now you have to come to court to defend the allegations made by that guy, that guy. The issue with that is, and the courts is clear on this, in order to serve you effectively, efficiently, according to the rules of procedure, it has to be a non-adverse party, a person that is not privy, that has nothing to do with the, the situation, because they have to be disinterested. They have to have nothing to do with the situation. The officer is the one to stop you. The officer is the one that gave you the summons. The officer is the one that is going to go to court testifying that you did something. So there's a conflict there. So that and other reasons is why traffic tickets, moving violations, citations, parking, all these things is easy to get rid of because of the defects and defaults with the process. Show you the federal rules. Uh, we're going to go into the, if you punch in the federal rules of civil procedure, and I believe it's going to be rule four that deals with service, you'll see what I'm talking about. So if you put in the federal rules of civil procedure and you go to the United States courts, it will give you the latest, uh, the latest true copy uh, with the, any uh, amendments, any changes, any alterations of the book. The book that I may have showed you in one of the older videos, that was a 2018 Federal Rules of Civil Procedure book. It's a red cover book. But now if you go into Federal Rules and you go to, like I said, I believe it's Rule 4. We're in, we're in, we're in. Let me make this bigger, take up the whole page. And so going through the first pages, first pages, and the contents is going to break down where everything is. And I believe it is rule four. Here we go. Table of contents. So rule four, which I think it is, is parties. Join the actions required, um, pleadings, defenses summons serving 
So rule two, okay, so four, 4.1, as I said, right? Oh, title, I was doing the titles on my bad. <laughs> so yeah, rule four. Uh, we're gonna scroll down to rule four, which is actually gonna be page eight. Can't be page eight, because this is saying 17 already. So rule 4.1, page eight in this document is actually, where is this page number? I'm not seeing a page number. All right, we'll just roll, scroll down. A, sorry for this. Right here, rule four summons. Okay, so rule four, A, contents amendments. A summons must name the court and parties, be directed to the defendant, state the name and address of the plaintiff's attorney, or if unrepresented of the plaintiff, state the time with within which the defendant must appear and defend, notify the defendant that a full, that a failure to appear and defend will result in a default judgment against the defendant for relief demanded in the complaint, must be signed by the clerk and bear the court seal. And goes down to issuance where we're going to go to service. So amendments, the court may permit a summons to be amended on issuance, on or after following the complaint. The plaintiff may present a summons to the clerk for signature and seal. If the summons is properly completed, the clerk must sign, seal it, issue it to the plaintiff for service on the defendant. Let's go there again. On or after the filing of the complaint, the plaintiff may present a summons to the clerk for signature and seal. If the summons is properly completed, the clerk must sign, seal, and issue it to the plaintiff for service on the defendant. Notice that process? The, the officer gave it to you. So a summons or a copy of a summons that is addressed to multiple defendants must be issued for each defendant to be served. Now we go to service. In general, a summons must be served with a copy of the complaint. The plaintiff is responsible for having the summons and complaints served within the time allowed by Rule 4M and must furnish the necessary copies to the person who makes service. Two, by whom? Any person who is at least 18 years old and not a party may serve a summons and complaint. Three, by marshal or someone appointed. So I don't need to keep going. This is the rules. This is the procedure. This is what they follow, and this is what you need to follow. All right? Federal rules, civil procedure, rule four. If your grandparents are still alive, who used to drive or still currently drive, ask them, when did parking tickets come about? When did speeding tickets come about? They'll tell you, we didn't pay any tickets. We didn't, they didn't have driver's license back in the days. Now, understandably, a lot of these rules and statutes and codes come into play for the common good. That's what they're going to call it, the common good. Whereas there needs to be some structure and some, some rules to keep everything organized and in order, allegedly. What happened is it became a, a revenue generator. It's a revenue generator. Because you are moving this vehicle and your taillight is out, that officer can now stop you and give you a $150 ticket. So now you have to pay for the light to get fixed and pay that ticket. And maybe court course. It's a revenue generator. It's robbery. It's robbery. If they pull you over, they tell you, okay, your light is out, you might want to get that fixed. Okay, thank you, officer. That's what that's supposed to. But it, it turned into something else. It's a revenue generator. So if you don't want to be a part of the farm and be one of the sheep that's getting fleeced, you will assert your unalienable rights. Now, if you call yourself, if you're allowed to be called a U.S. citizen with a small c, you are part of a club. And with the, the membership in that club has its... Um, rules and regulations. And part of the rules and regulations is that you are abiding by or you agree to these stops. You agree to pay these fines and different things or you're not going to argue them. You don't want to bite the hand that feeds you type thing, but they're not feeding you. But I think you get the gist of what I'm saying. So when you 
are a U.S. citizen, you're a voter, you vote the legislature in, you vote the judiciary in, you vote these individuals in and make these laws. So if you voted for that governor, you voted for that mayor, you voted for that council person who in turn devises these bills that become law, then you agree with it because there are your representatives that came up with this stuff. I am a state citizen with a big C, which means I owe allegiance at this point to the state of Pennsylvania. Meaning if anyone that wants to do any persons, any inhabitants, any citizens of this state any harm, I am, to, I am, I'm, um, I am obligated, I am expected to defend the state. I am obligated, and when I say state, I mean the people of, like I am obligated to look out for the people of the state, take up arms and protect my fellow citizen with the big C. The state's powers is big, which is why when the mass mandate was handed down, they handed it down on the federal level, meaning any federal properties, any federal zones, post office, um, public roads, public uh, transportation, anything federally related, that mandate applies to their schools. It doesn't apply to your home. It doesn't apply to outside my door. It technically doesn't apply to the grocery store, but the private grocery store owners can uphold that mandate. So the states decide whether we're gonna adopt that or we're just gonna ignore it, which is why federally marijuana has been decriminalized. But on the state level, individual states is now taking it up. New York says, yeah, we're gonna legalize it. Pennsylvania's like, uh, we'll think about it. Other states are like, uh, yeah, no, yeah. So it's the states that make the decisions. Where am I going? To not make this video extra super long, let me go back and let me just deal with do not detain, do not stop, et cetera. Because I can, I can make this in several parts and I might just do that. I, make this, I might make this in several parts to really give you the understanding of what is going on so you know what you can and should do. So the stop that you see here who knows what it was about, but it involves a sheriff pulling over a motorist. He could have been speeding, he could have been inebriated, whatever the case. If that individual was accused of a crime, not a traffic infraction, a crime, a robbery, a murder, um, vehicle homicide where the, he hit somebody, killed somebody, or something like something of that extreme nature. Those things are stoppable, detainable events. Not to say that a broken headlight and speeding aren't detainable events because they fall into the same category. However, there are infractions. It's like a misdemeanor. It's below a misdemeanor. It's not that serious. What you can and should do is, you are supposed to devise some paperwork and put your governor, your mayor, your sheriff, your secretary of state of your state and of the United States, if you would like, you put them on notice that as I move about and I enjoy my freedoms, I wanna be left alone by your henchmen, with the exception, the, this, it's the unspoken exception, murder, uh, homicide, uh, robbery, all these victim crimes, all of these crimes, you can get stopped and detained because that's a serious offense. Traffic infractions is not. So you write to your governor, all these uh, public officials, and what you do, it is called a notice of intent 
to sue. You're intending to sue them if their officers stop you for infractions, for minor nuisances. If they detain you for minor nuisances. This paperwork needs to be in prior to your stop. Now, if you're one that constantly comes in contact with law enforcement, you know, time is of essence, put that paperwork in. If you never come in contact with them, you should still put the paperwork in because it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. What you'll do is you'll send these letters to these individuals, governor, sheriff, mayor, secretary of state, and you put them on notice that I am going to exercise my rights and I would wish to be left alone by your henchmen. Tell them or place me on a do not detain list. Place me on whatever list. Um, put me on that list. Excuse me from these little traffic infractions from your revenue generating machine. You're gonna do it in an administrative process way. You're going to send the first letter. Sometimes they respond. Most of the time they don't. You send the second letter. It's called a notice of fault and opportunity to cure. That means I sent you something. You didn't respond. Maybe you got lost in the mail. Maybe you just overlooked it. Maybe you ran out of time. Here's an opportunity to address what I sent you. And make sure you get your henchmen off me or away from me and stop following me. Oftentimes they don't respond to that second letter. You then send the third letter, which is a notice of default. I sent you a first letter. You ignored it or you didn't respond effectively. I sent you a second letter. I know you got it. You still didn't respond. So now you are in default. You send them that default paperwork, which is still not going to respond. And now you take that default, which you could create a certificate of default and take it to your notary. Now, I'm jumping along the process because you know what? Let me let me do it like this. Let me take it step by step so you understand what I'm talking about. The first letter that you send to those public officials, you're not going to send yourself. The same defect of the officer handing you the officer handing you a ticket is the same defect of you actually giving or serving these individuals. Sometimes it's okay, and sometimes or I. I my process, no, I always use a third party to mail my correspondence. And I use a certificate of mailing and I make sure I send a certified mail return receipt. So you send it to them via another party. That party is a witness because that party put the stuff in the envelope, the letters in the envelope, the party mailed it. So now if you get called into, or you, you drag them into court, you can bring your witness that has nothing to do with you, not related to you, that says, yes, I mailed all three letters and I did not get a response. Neither did the plaintiff. So in your letters, you're going to address that or you're going to state that you need to respond to Robert Marshall, aka Bud Brownsville, and you need to respond to the witness, the witness, the person that mails your letter. They're not going to respond to you guys. Sometimes they do, but they're not going to respond. The second letter goes out. Your, your, your guy, your notary or your guy or girl is going to send that letter out. So this is the administrative process. Somebody is verifying that this letter was sent to that person. Your certified mail return receipt comes back that they signed for it. So they got it. So they can't say they didn't get it. After the third letter goes out, you now get a certificate of mailing. That certificate of mailing is now your mailer certifying that, yes, I sent these documents out on behalf of the plaintiff and the other party did not respond to me. And the plaintiff said they didn't respond to them. So they are in default. You can get a summary judgment on that. And whatever you listed in your notice now becomes true because it's like an unrebutted affidavit. It's also you are demanding, in a sense, the public officials address your concerns, and they're not. So that certificate of mailing becomes a summary judgment. 
Now, with that summary judgment, you can actually ask for penalties, you can ask for um, compensation, or you can ask for an injunction, AKA a notice or uh, um, uh, order of protection. You can say, I wish to be left alone by these individuals. These officers should not pull me over anymore, the sheriffs or the local police department. Now, side note, you should do this in the area in which you live, in your town, in your county, your state. Because what happens is once you win that fight in your local jurisdiction, you now can take that summary judgment to the next state or to the tri-states, the states that are connected to you that you travel to. And you send that to them and tell them, listen, I want to put your officers on notice as well. I am going to be exercising my unalienable rights and I want to be left alone. So as long as I don't, and you don't have to put this in there, but as long as you don't kill, injure, or defraud anyone, you know, crimes are com committed, you shouldn't be stopping me. You shouldn't be detaining me. You shouldn't be leaving me alone. So that in essence is the do not detain list. Do they put you on that list? The, the, the jury's still out. The jury's still out. My paperwork is in in New York, New Jersey, and I sent some letters to um, Pennsylvania. I didn't finish the process in Pennsylvania. I need to brush up my paperwork in Pennsylvania. Once I get stopped after my certificate of default is, is signed, sealed, I didn't go to court. I don't, you, you can go to the court and get that, de that default judgment. I got them now. It's default judgment. Hold on to that paperwork because now if you get stopped anytime after receiving that default judgment, you got them because, hold on, they're supposed to leave me alone. Now you go to court. If I, if I confuse you on that step. So you get the certificate of, or the, or the, um, you get the default or the or certificate of default. You take that to your county. The county clerk is going to stand that you got a default because the other party failed to respond, which they're going to actually reach out to them and say, okay, listen, what's going on here? Uh, get them some time to respond. Most of the time they don't. And oftentimes they give it to you. Now, what happens is when you try to enforce it, when you attempt to enforce it, the other party may say, well, I don't know what's going on. What's happening? Uh, I'm being sued the same way you get the, the garnishment letters and all these things. Oh, what's going on? Well, you would default it. They, you default them as well. So you have that certificate of default. You have that summary judgment. Now, you're operating your vehicle and you get stopped. Immediately, you go and you file a suit. Now you're suing, because it was a notice of intent to sue. Now you're gonna file your lawsuit with your summary judgment. And you're gonna request that injunction or an order of protection. That is how the order, the, the do not detain is activated. That is how it gets activated. So if you understand the step, you understand the process. They will now have to put you on their computers in their system do not detain, do not stop, do not question. And they may put some, um, some request requisites in there unless this happens, unless this happens. So speeding, moving, uh, um, all these different things. Now, if you're speeding and you hit someone, you're speeding, you cause an accident. That is a crime because you cause an injury. They will detain you. You may get arrested. But any basic infractions from jaywalking to, um, well, marijuana has been decriminalized. So, and it's a misdemeanor to some degree. So it's a low level crime. Even stuff like that, they are not allowed to detain you. You can put this stuff in your paperwork. If I am moving about, exercising my free rights to do such, such, and so, the burden of, of proof or the, the rebuttal is on them to say, well, no, you can't do, well, I mean, the law is the law. If there is a law in your town that says you can't do such and such, they don't need to respond to you and say, you don't, you don't the law is law, it's already there, it's already written. However, these infractions, they shouldn't be stopping you. It depends on your status too. Or oh, maybe, see, I, it's so much entailed in this conversation. Your status should be such that you are now representing yourself as an American citizen with a big C, 
not a U.S. citizen, or you are a national. You are a national. So that is your status. If you put your status on the record that this is who I am and I wish to be left alone, this puts the wheels in motion as, okay, you're not a U.S. citizen. You're not one of their subjects. They have to leave you alone. This is how this process goes. So I hope I did that some justice. And I love to leave it here. I love to leave it and let you guys comment and ask questions and let's interact. Let's, let's you know, break bread on this particular topic. I also want to talk about relating to your paperwork when you send in the notice of intent to sue. You're going to quote persuasive arguments, persuasive arguments to the effect of uh, how long have you been licensed? I've been licensed since I was 17 years old. I'm 50 now. So I've been driving all these years. That means I should have a degree of skill. I should know what I'm doing. I've taken defensive driving courses. All these different things is evidence. And when you are making your case, when you are um, staking your claim, it is the preponderance of the evidence that sways the court. So with your preponderance of the evidence, meaning, okay, here's my driving record. Here, I've never had any accidents. Or, you know, I never had any accidents. I have a clean driving record. I took the defensive driving course. These are the reasons to say, okay, you should be stopping me. I am a professional driver. I have a license, excuse me, I have a license. That license means I know what I'm doing. Just like lawyers are supposed to have a, 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 a bar license, that bar license now, gives them the right to practice law. They are professionals. A doctor has a, a, a license to practice medicine. They are professionals. So you have a driver's license. That means I'm a professional. You shouldn't be stopping me from minor nuisances. Okay, so I hope you get the gist of the message. How do you do the process? I'll show you here. Here's the paperwork that I actually filled out. Okay, so here is one of the letters that was sent to, or notices that was sent to the US Attorney General at the time, Loretta Lynch. And first and foremost, let me give the credit where credit is due. I've watched um, not all of them, but a good majority of the webinars presented by Yusuf L and Jonah Bay, not, to, not combined, you know, individually, they made, numerous webinars on this on this topic and this actual form is from uh Yusuf L's process so it's just a, it's the same paperwork but uh i believe my strategy my my procedure may be slightly different but nonetheless um those two giants in the field of this education and this information uh, Jonah Bay and Yusuf L shout out to them so on the page that i created i made a header and put the uh, certified mail number in there. So it was attached to the document itself. Um, I tried not to give them as much wiggle room, them being whoever, whomever I'm sending my letters to, much wiggle room to get out of you know, my documentation. So there's a header and a footer. And I believe it's at the footer as well. Let me go down here real fast. Come on. No, it's just at the header. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the entire document. <clears throat> I'm just going to point out specific things on the document that really, really matter. And this statement here is a big statement. I use it everywhere on all my documents. Notice the agent is notice the principal. Notice the principal is notice the agent. Okay. Uh, this is a notice of reservation of your rights and notice of intent to sue if they you know, infringe on those rights. And some other points I want to point out on this. Now, this particular uh, notice of reservation of my rights, tend to sue, was mainly focusing on travel and traveling in my vehicle. Uh, what one could do is also put some paperwork together or combine some documentation, some information with regards to um, firearms and your right to bear arms. 
you could put that in there. Um, your right for free speech. There are some places that uh, do not recognize you as press or as someone you know exercising your right to the press, whereas they want you to be from an organization or they want you to have a press pass or something issued from your employer. But that's not they didn't have any any organizations back then or I'm not going to say it like that just because they the powers that be right now are requesting that you have that that's not what the constitution says it, there's no restrictions on your freedom of press so they should restrict it as well so that's a little something that you can add into your documentation as well now this is eight pages the notice of intent to sue and I'm scrolling up kind of slowly so you can actually get a, a glimpse of what's in here. I redacted my signature because of the magic of the internet. Anyone can swipe it, put it on documentation and say, I, you know, sign it. Not going to happen to me. So I have um, reservation of your rights. And this was put in in 2016 in September or issued. I sent mine to the mayor of my um, jurisdiction at that time. I sent it to the secretary of state of my, or I'm sorry, the, um, the attorney general of my area at that time, the governor. I sent it to the uh, traffic, uh, what is the traffic? Um, I'll get it in a second. <laughs> Department of Transportation, yeah, I sent it to them. And page five so far. Now, once we go down to page eight, we're going to jump into the process. So this is the first page that you would send. And you would send this with your uh, affidavit of corporate denial, along with this um, affidavit of truth that's within this document. And coming up on the last pages here. So I said that uh, this is what this is what was mailed in that package, the first package. Notice of reservation of rights and of intent to sue, the affidavit of reservation of rights, affidavit of truth, affidavit of denial of corporate resistance, and also sent the color of law form. So this page, this particular document, just scroll, I just scroll down, had eight pages. So two, three, seven. Um, all right, and this page makes eight. All right, this is the eighth page. Well, the eighth page is blank. Okay, but yeah, you, you see what I did there. And this is the copies of the mailings. So this, in a sense, is your proof that you sent it to them. This is this is this is gold when you when you go to court and you you know fighting your case or defending your case that you've sent them documentation you've mailed them documentation. What matters even more is what was in that envelope and who mailed it. So this particular one, certificate of mailing. See my um my notary at the time mailed this. He has see he what he, what happened is I went to my notary and in front of him I put the documents inside the envelope. He saw he, I showed him the documents. He we I put it in an envelope and he watched me seal it and I mailed it. We mailed it. <laughs> we mailed it. So he is the, the witness on regard. So he watched the process and he attested to what happened. All right. So you can use your notary in the same fashion as if you have a willing participant. And this is the notice of fault. So the first letter was sent out that was not responded to. And what we did was we sent them a uh, notice of fault, an opportunity to cure. And... I'm going to see if it says in here. I'm pretty sure it does. In the event you fail to respond.
okay, so no, I didn't have them respond to the notary on this mailing. If I'm not mistaken, the notice of default was sent to them and given them like five to 15 days or something to respond. But at that time, they had to respond to me and the notary. And the proof is, oh, well, how you prove, oh, oh, what's what's going on there is you sent the no, these notices out with the help of your witness. And because your witness is proof that these mess, these letters were sent out, there should have been a response. Now, if they did indeed respond to respond it, but you did not, you were not truthful, you didn't say that they did, and you just destroyed their correspondence, they're going to come to court with their proof that they mailed it. And now, you know, there's an issue that needs to be resolved. But because they never respond, they're not going to have that proof that is needed on their end to say that, yes, they did respond to your, your paperwork. So you have a witness that watched you or you watched them send the documentation to these people. And once they don't respond the first and second time, when you send out that last notice of default, in that notice, you tell them that now you have to respond to the notary in me or your witness in me. That would prove that they either are ignoring your documentation or that they are responding because now when they send that notice, if they do respond and they send it to your witness or they send it to your notary and they provide proof in court that, hey, I sent it to him and I sent it to his notary or to his witness and here's my proof. Now you got a problem. There, there's some kind of perjury there or some kind of issue there that will definitely need to be addressed. But as I keep saying, 99.5% of the time, <laughs> do they ever respond or they, they don't respond. Okay, so certificate of service. And here it is. This is my notary attesting that he put the documents inside the envelope, which he did and sent it to them. And that's his documentation here, the receipts that it was sent, they signed for it. And there was a duplicate. Come on. And here is the notice of default. So again, notice that statement goes with everything I send out. This is a notice of reservation of rights, notice of intent to sue the affidavit of truth. This was sent on that day because they didn't respond. And this is me breaking down what happened. We sent it, you didn't answer, yada, 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 and you're in default. And I need to see if I actually had them respond back to the notary. Because this was done in 2016. And I think I've deviated from this process since then. And I made sure that they responded to my, or well, I've made some statements in it that they respond to my notary. Failure to the full right? No matter is, but it's got to stop responding failure. So no, in this documentation sent out in 2016, I did not make a statement in this notice that they would have to respond to my notary or my witness and myself. I've subsequently changed this up when I help other people with their paperwork because that step is kind of important. Only because of the, the, the new information that I've acquired that you know, you're a party to it and you're not really supposed to serve them. Your witness is supposed to serve them. All right. So hope you uh, catch that point. I hope you uh, don't make the same uh, defect that I have. We're going to call it the legal term defect. And that's the process. That's what you do and how it's done. All right. Later.
And this is all about the do not detain, do not arrest, do not stop, the do not detain list. A lot of people are, are not familiar or they need more information on what it, what it is, what we're talking about, and how do you get on this list. So if you listen to, I hate to say gurus, if you listen to individuals, you know, you feel this out, you do this, and boom, you want to do it without saying this. They're selling you a package. That's not how this thing works. Because if it did, everybody and their mama would be on the um, do not detain list. There's a process to this that you have to go about. And I just laid out the steps. You do the administrative process. You send them documentation with persuasive arguments or persuasive evidence. The evidence is statutes and codes and opinions. See, my opinion doesn't matter. The court's opinion does matter because precedent is a legal term that means what happened in a court case before your court case, if the, the details are similar, you're supposed to be handled or your case is supposed to be handled in that, in that similar matter. So if a case was dismissed or if ruled in the favor of the driver in the instance because of this, because of that, because of that, and your situation is similar, press, that's precedent. You need to do what that judge did and you need to rule that way. Judges take you tell them to take judicial notice judicial notice on that particular instance on these cases on that case law make sure it's good case law so you have persuasive arguments to back up what you're saying you send that in most of the time they do not respond to your letters you default them you take that the, the default and that certificate of default to the county clerk and you get a summary judgment then you sit and you wait. You wait until now they breach because it's now an agreement. They, they have to leave you alone, so to speak. It's, a, it's, it's an unspoken or it's, it's an un, um, it's an unofficial ruling. Yeah, you have that summary judgment on this particular matter, but they may not know about it. You can send them a letter. You can send them just the summary judgment to say, okay, do this now, leave me alone. Put me on that list. Chances are they're not. You're going to have to now pull the trigger and pull the trigger of once you get stopped, you now take that summons, you take your default judgment, and you say, or your summary judgment, you say, listen, they pulled me over again. I thought we took care of this. What's happening here? I demand an injunction. I demand to be left alone by these revenue officers. And that is how you become one of the few on the do not detain list, if that list exists. So there's not necessarily a list. I mean, put on the list of Roberts on there, the Bud's on there. No, it's just a notation in their records and their computer system that says this person operating this vehicle, either with this social security number or this identifying number, leave them alone so in your letters and i'm give a lot of information here i mean i i try to be a little a little i uh, like if even if i write this crap down and go step by step by step and stuff i leave out it just so much but in your letter you're going to write your driver's license number you're going to write your plate number if you have several cars like i do you're going to write all your car your plate numbers down so now they know this vehicle do not Bother it, leave it alone. Do you update it? Do you, can you amend it? Yes, if you buy new cars, you get other cars, you drive in other vehicles. All the vehicles that you operate, it could be your sister's car, your mother's car, your father's car, you give those, that information. I will be operating these vehicles, leave me alone. Done, done. So I hope I did this some justice. I hope I answered the question that the, uh, I had a, a viewer ask me particularly about the do not detain and I told him I'd make a video. So I hope I answered that question. I hope I answered other people's questions on this matter. And if not, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. I mean, everybody has an opinion. <laughs> there's only a certain amount of facts. So there's certain law is law. What is written is written. 
you can make your own law and your or your own law is that affidavit that that statement that you made that summary judgment that you that's it's that's your own law now because they have to abide by that judge that that ruling all right so i thank you for watching if this content that you received today was beneficial by all means hit my cash app <laughs> Tell me thank you. Leave me a comment. You know, let me know if if the content is to your liking or if I need to raise the standards. <laughs> let me know what you think. I listen and I respond to all of my comments and calls and texts and emails. It's Bud Brownsville talking about the do not the same list, aka the order protection, the injunction. And you guys be safe out there. And get your paperwork game up because it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Peace.